Right. Well, I think we'll start now. Good evening from London and welcome on behalf of Harif, the UK Association of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, Shana tov, Tova to you all, or Tiskuli Shanim Rabot, as we Sephardim say. Um, welcome to you all, whether you're regulars or those who are new to Harif. My name is Lynn Julius, and I'm ably assisted tonight by our technical expert, Lawrence. Harif is run by a small group of volunteers, and we aim to raise awareness of the history and culture of Middle Eastern and North African Jews. We've been running an active Zoom program for the past year and a half. You are welcome to subscribe to our mailing list if you're not already there. You can find us at www.harif.org uh, where you can also see past recordings. There'll be an opportunity to ask questions after our panel discussion and the entire event should take uh, between one and one and a half hours. Our subject tonight is how can Middle Eastern Jews reclaim their heritage? Now the flight from Arab countries of almost a million Jewish refugees in the latter half of the 20th century entailed the abandonment or seizure of movable Jewish heritage. To be clear, we're not talking about private property owned by Jews. We are not talking about immovable communal property like synagogues or Jewish schools. We're talking about movable communal property. That's records, archives, documents, artifacts, Torah scrolls, Rimonim, Menorot, Hanukiot. All these things are, and these objects are part of a people's memory. And I was struck uh, by a quotation which I wrote in, which I read in uh, Bruce Montgomery's book, actually. It's by uh, the Czech writer Milan Kundera, and Bruce is one of our panelists tonight. Um, and Kundera wrote, you begin to liquidate a people by its memory. You destroy its books, its culture, its history, and then others write books for it, give another culture to it, invent another history for it. So who owns Jewish heritage? You might have thought it was self-evident that the Jewish communities now in exile do. Uh, but Arab governments are claiming that the movable heritage of exiled minority groups is part of their national heritage. And they are willing to go to quite extreme lengths uh, to prove this. For instance, in, in Yemen, there was a case of uh, a man who was arrested, a Jewish man called Levi Salim Mahabi. He was arrested in 2017 on the grounds that he had helped smuggle out a Torah scroll from Yemen to Israel. And this man is actually is still languishing in jail. His health has deteriorated and he is one of only six Jews still in Yemen. So what are the chances that Jewish heritage will be restored to its rightful owners? And what avenues, legal or otherwise, are open to them or us? So our co-sponsors this evening for this very important event are the Simon Wiesenthal Center Europe and Jimena, which stands for Jews Indigenous to the Middle East and North Africa, and can be described as Harif's counterpart in the US. We are very honored tonight to have with us a distinguished international panel. Um, we have Eve Fadida, Carol Basri and Adriana Davis. We have Bruce Montgomery. We have Aurora Casero. We have Nitsana Darshan-Leitner. 
and uh, we have Shimon Samuels representing the Simon Wiesenthal Center. So without further ado, I would like to turn to our first panelist and ask Eve Dida uh, to speak or to actually sum up um, the main issues that concern him. Eve Fadida is the co-founder of the Nebi Daniel Association, which aims to preserve Egyptian Jewish heritage. And he's joining us from Paris. So Eve, you've been running a, a very long campaign to gain access to Jewish communal records. Can you tell us more? Yes, thank you, Lynn. Good evening, Shana Tuva, and as we say in Egypt, Kolesana um, to let, let me, I think we'll probably be discussing the, 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 the potential uh, issue, well, the issues at, uh, at the end of the discussion, once everybody has presented his case. Let me present the case of what is at stake in Egypt. And um, if I may share my screen, that would be easier for me. Um, yep, it should be fine now. Yep. Can you see it? Uh, we can't see it yeah, yet. It's enabled. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I need to. I need to do that. Okay. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Fine. So. Um, So basically, Egyptian, we, we start with a, the with a basic assumption, uh, the basic uh, tenant, and that is that Egyptian law states that anything in Egypt which is over 100 years old is Egyptian and cannot be exported. Now, it stands to reason then that any action uh, should follow this the halachic injunction, dina de malchuta dina, which is the law of the land is the law. Now, on on-site inventory in Cairo and Alexandria, we ascertained that out of 140 remaining Torah scrolls, 60 were under 100 years old, and of these, only 40 were worth repair. Despite the request from the chief rabbi of France, Egyptians have lent a deaf ear. On the other hand, there is nothing unique about these 40 scrolls, um, and their production never ceases in the world. The same can be said of textiles such as parochet or silverware such as menorahs and their tamid. The collection of registers and archives, um, however, can, can you see any, everything that's written or, or, or not? Yes, yes, um, uh, we can. Yeah. Yes, it's fine. The right -hand yes, side. There's a bit of interference in your uh, sound little bit of in interference, but uh, basically we can see everything. The collection of registers and archives, however, is truly unique. It is currently unreachable in the abyss of Egyptian National Archives because part of the collection goes back to the early 19th century. Our approach has therefore been to aim for a mere copy of these documents because of the Egyptian law. They consist of 60,000 pages approximately in 600 registers, 30 indexes of personal, religious, civil identity data and tomb locations. Now, this concerns about 150,000 individuals and well over 200,000 descendants across the world. The documents were created because the Ottoman Empire administered its communities through the millet system, conferring on urban rabbinic courts the exclusive authority to register define and oversee the civil and religious status um, of their fold, both vis-a-vis -vis authorities in Egypt, rabbinic authorities abroad, and even foreign governments. Now this renders them international private legal documents. Now the system remained mandatory in Egypt until January 1956. There are four types of documents, life cycle events, Circumcision, birth, bar mitzvah, engagement, dowry for destitute girls, marriage, divorce, death, tomb, location, conversions. General events, uh, which are uh, in the celibacy of civil state affidavits, which were used for issuing passports or establishing bona fide affidavits for people. And we have rabbinical rulings and dependent cities 
cities like Tanta were dependent on, on, on Alexandria, cities like Damanhu, maybe on Cairo and so on. And then we have loose documents that were left in the community, for instance, Ketubot, which were left in trust when people left. Um, yeah. Now, all entries into the registers were paid for by levies, by fees that were levied. This alone, I think, confers inalienable property rights to the descendants. And from the late 19th century, they include family pictures and a host of geneal genealogy details. They are not concerned with financial patrimony. Languages were Italian, French, Arabic, Hebrew, and we have diverse scripts in Hebrew. And this is critical, by the way, for the further exploitation of this. You need really specialists. It is a unique and complete collection covering the period from 1830 on and earlier from, for Cairo up to the departure of the last rabbi. Hence our request for a simple copy within the framework of Egyptian law. It was imposed by the Ottomans on Egyptian soil. In a sense, the records are no more Egyptian than would say British consular records. Uh, because they concern civil and religious status of Jews who were not born in Egypt, but who have merely lived there, of Jews who were born in Egypt, but who were nationals of other countries, that's about 30% of the Jews, Jews who were born in Egypt, but were stateless, that's 40% of the Jews, Jews who were born in Egypt and who were Egyptian nationals, about 30%, but who were forcefully denaturalized. Whether you were a believer or an atheist, um, you had to pay uh, for the administrative registration in the community and you had to pay for each entry. We also have to, to state that Egypt has a separate registration office of different types, but dating back to World War, World War I. The community information is not essential for them, it is essential for us. And at the time when the government itself recognizes there are two living Jewish communities in Egypt, only Jews have had their documents withheld. Not the Greeks, not the Armenians, not the Protestants, not the Catholics, not the Orthodox. These registers still have multiple ongoing practical use. And only a rabbinic authority is the appropriate judge in capacity of it to exploit them. It is a human rights issue, and I must state that the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, signed by Egypt, entitles us to recognition everywhere as a person before the law, and not only in Egypt, which rejected its Jews. I must also under, under, underline that the conditions, the legal conditions under which these registers came into the National Archives are questionable. And having cleansed Egypt of its Jews because of their identity, the government now adds insult to injury by depriving Jews of that very identity. There could only be world acclaim for Egypt if it allowed such a copy abroad. But so far, 18 years of lobbying has not permitted us to applaud. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eve, for that very succinct uh, summary of uh, the issue. Just one question. Um, I, I understand that the government is reluctant to uh, release these, the uh, records to Egyptian Jews for financial reasons. They're, they're, they're worried about you claiming compensation. Is that well, correct? Yeah, we initially thought that they were um, that they were um, uh, convinced that there was financial indication within the records uh, that could ha that could be brought to court against them, but this is this is complete nonsense, and they've had five years to go over the records to see that there is no financial consideration within the records. The fact that with the records we could ask for financial compensation uh, towards the Egyptian government is also not uh, uh, an argument because these records are not supposed to go into our hands or into any political hands. They're supposed to go into a rabbinical authority. And the rabbinical authority can very well establish an agreement with the Egyptian government that these records will remain 
um, uh, uh, for usage by the rabbinical authority and only by the rabbinical authority. So I think this question of financial consideration is something that they they make up to convince themselves, but it is a, it's a no go. It's it's it doesn't exist as a as a as an argument. Right, and and where are the um, the the books that were in your archives in the synagogue archives? Where are they now? Well, the registers are within the Egyptian National Archives. Uh, they, they were taken there and, and uh, we have not been able to access, not even be able to see them there, but we, we've been told they were there. Um, for many years, we've lobbied through various, uh, I, I'm, I'm taking over the five minutes now, but uh, for it's many years, we've, we've, lobbied, we've, we've lobbied the, um, the Egyptian government um, through different uh, methods, both through um, the, uh, with the help of the American Jewish Committee, visits to the for foreign ministers, visits to uh, the, the councillors of the presidency, um, uh, through embassies, through American embassies, British embassies, French embassies in Cairo, through Egyptian embassies in, in, in France and in America. We've lobbied the Egyptian government with the help of the CRIF, or with the help of the consistoire with the help of the british board of deputies and we've had really no reply on that specific score there are informal replies that don't come to even close to our ears but there is really no formal reply on that because it, it, it the, the formal reply would not make sense there is nothing in these records that could harm egypt and there is nothing in these records that when it's put into the hands of a rabbinical authority could be used against Egypt. Furthermore, everybody who's wanted to bring a case, a financial case against Egypt, because they had a lot of money, were able to bring a case against Egypt. There was a law, there was an open window in the late 90s where people could bring a case to claim for their property. Whether that claim, uh, hello? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Whether, whether that claim actually brought the money, some people won their claim. And th the best example is the Cecil Hotel in Alexandria, great big hotel. This uh, hotel, they, they, won the, they won the hotel back. The owners won the hotel back without any kind of reference to the records. And uh, it, you, these records are really just civil and religious records. There's nothing in them that can hurt Egypt and we can say this over and over again, but it's the right authorities that need to say that uh, to the right people in Egypt that can be convinced of it. Right. Thank you very much indeed, Eve, uh, for that. I'd now like to turn to Carol Basri and Adriana Davis, who uh, have made a film called Saving the Iraqi Jewish Archive. Um, Adriana, I think, is a, a professional filmmaker, and Carol is also a lawyer whose family are Iraqi Jews. Um, so I'd like to ask you both, can you summarize the issue of the Iraqi Jewish archive? Carol. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to thank Eve for his summary. Uh, we're concerned because the Iraqi Jewish archives is composed of communal archives, as well as the archives of the Frankini School, which was owned by my grandfather. Um, we've made several movies documenting this, dating as far back as 1995. Um, the property of the Iraqi Jews was taken from them after it, they uh, were denaturalized if they decided they wanted to leave the country in 1951, then a law was passed that said, if you had deemed to leave the country, you would lose all of your property. Um, and so you lost your first, by leaving the country, you lost your, um, your citizenship. And then because you lost that, they put in this freeze and you lost all your property. And, and that included all your personal property. You were only allowed to take, um, uh, one suitcase with basically three sets of clothing and $50 to start another life. So it's important to be aware of that fact as we go through this. Um, now, the Iraqi Jewish archives were found by 
uh, Harold Rhodes, who was going to be on the program, but he's not here. He was told by Ahmed Chalabi, who was told by somebody from the Mukhubarat, who wanted to get a pass saying that um, he should be uh, open to uh, not being considered a Ba'ath because he was helping the new coalition provisional authority. So he did that. And um, so that's how the Iraqi Jewish archives came about. Uh, it is a good example of talking about movable artifacts and cultural property. And um, I've been working with Jamina, the American Sephardic Federation. Um, I've uh, worked with Aurora Kassir on a pro bono basis. She's been wonderful in trying to help us to get uh, the, uh, the archives to uh, be um, remain in, in the US, maybe be sent to Israel, hopefully to the Babylonian Heritage Center. And also the idea that um, it was the property of the Jews of Iraq because it was taken from them. We were never allowed to leave with any of our property. So there are, are things in that archive that have been digitized for the presentation that was done by the National Archives of what they preserved in about 2000 feet, but it hasn't been looked at religious scholars or scholars or academics for that purpose. We were able to get somebody to go in to look at a small fragment that they had found they thought was the Ben Ishkai's writing that was Rabbi Saltoun of the Sephardic Heritage Museum in Brooklyn. And because we were able to do that, um, with the help of Senator uh, Schumer, we found actually in the end three books of the Ben Ishchai, which have since been published um, in the Jewish community, the Syrian community and the Iraqi Jewish community contributed to getting that printed. And it's being used by scholars now, but we have no full inventory of what's there. And um, we've asked repeatedly for it. We have not had everything digitized, so we don't really know what's there. Now to show you, and I loved your quote, others invent another's history for you. We've just found out from the um, Ben Svi Institute when we looked at the archives there, and I have to thank Janet Dalal who's on this call because she brought it to my attention. Um, it, it's very important because we've always been under the assumption that the official Iraqi government report, which is quoted, only 110 Jews and Muslims were killed. But in fact, um, it's over a thousand, according to the um, document at the Ben Svi Institute from the Religious Zionist Workers Archives dated July 17, 1941, that's kept by the Jewish agency. And um, at the height of the slaughter in a local hospital where poison injections were administered, it caused the death of 120 Jewish patients. The hospital director in charge had his privileges to treat patients removed and taken away for five years. Now, think about the difference between that and over a thousand people being killed plus 120 people uh, being given um, injections to kill them by the hospital, the head of the hospital versus the claim that's always been made that there's 110 Jews and Muslims that were killed in the Farood. Somebody is rewriting our history. People have estimated the, the mass graves, but nobody has a count. This is the only thing that was done at the time that really um, it's critical that we be able to, um, to reference that. So at any rate, um, I, uh, I wanted to point that out and why the archives is so important because we don't want somebody else to rewrite our history. Very important that we don't have that happen, that nobody should rewrite our history. So I don't wanna take up more time because we also have a time constraint here of five minutes. And I wanna to turn to, um, to you, Do, would you? Um, yeah, Adriana. Yes, to yes. To Adriana. Thank you. And then I can go through the MOUs if you want after that. So, yes, thank you. Pleasure to be here with everyone today, Shana Tola. Um, I want to play a little trailer from our current film, Saving the Iraqi Jewish Archives, A Journey of Identity. It is the seventh in our series of films, as Carol mentioned, about uh, the Iraqi Jewish culture and history. Give me one moment. I'm going to share my screen and play you just the trailer. 
one thing my mom told me, she said, when you leave Baghdad, never talk about the stuff that happened. Don't talk about it at all. And I, she said, nobody wants to hear morbid stories because whatever happened was morbid. Nobody wants to know morbid. Nobody wants to hear morbid. I told her, but why? I want everybody to know what we've been through if we survive, if we get out with people that I don't know. I, I don't think I volunteer. I still don't volunteer to say I'm Jewish and Iraqi. I said I was Jewish. She said I was asked whether I spoke any Yiddish, and I said no. She said, what kind of a Jew are you? So I responded, do you speak Judeo Arabic? She said, no. I said, what kind of a Jew are you? And I never forgot that incident, you know? And then you start more and more to think, yes, okay, we have to tell the story. The story of the Iraqi Jewish community began 2,700 years ago. It's a complex tapestry woven with beauty and sorrow. Just as the Tigris and Euphrates flow together, Iraqi Jews continue their journey of identity. Fragments of their religious and cultural heritage, once ripped from their grasp, have unexpectedly surfaced with the miraculous discovery of the Iraqi Jewish archives. Could it be that these religious books, Torahs, and school records Precious markers of the soul are now drifting back into their lives. Thank you very much for that, Adriana. So just to be clear, the archive was discovered by complete chance by Harold Road, and they were sitting in the waterlogged basement of the secret police headquarters. Uh, the Americans shipped thousands of these documents, uh, Jewish documents, Torah scrolls, uh, books, etc., to that. America to be restored. Um, and there was an agreement signed uh, with between the American government and the Iraqi government. No. Is that right? No. no. No, okay. it yeah. was signed between NARA, the National Archives of the United States, and yeah. the Coalition Provisional Authority. There was no input from the Iraqis or the Iraqi Jews. Right. So this agreement was to return this archive, which Iraqi Jews claim as their no, own property. It was not to return it. It was at a time in the future to decide what would be done. Right, so can you update us on what the current situation is with the archive? Well, it's complicated because we were told it was going to be sent back this year, 2021, and that's what's on record. However, um, there have been musings coming from the, I, I can't use another word for it, from the US State Department that says um, that it may be able to stay longer but they can't seem to get anything in writing from the Iraqis um, as to an extension because it doesn't seem like any Iraqi official wants to put their name on any kind of document. So we're really in a state of limbo. So the most current understanding that's official is that it's, it's supposed to go back in 2021. Right, okay. Well, thank you very much for that, Carol. And Adriana. May I just mention one last yeah, thing? Sure. Um, I just wanted to explain that the film, though it said coming soon, it has actually been playing in film festivals through the last uh, year, uh, including Miami Jewish, New York Sephardic Jewish, Toronto International Women's, Delaware International Women's, where it received two awards for outstanding excellence um, in the religion faith category and the feature documentary category. Uh, we also had a private screening, thank you, Jimena, uh, for a lot of different people. And lastly, I have to say in June 2021, in the Montreal Independent Film Festival, this film was given the Best Human Rights Documentary Award, which we are really proud of because that is the central focus of the film about the human rights of the Iraqi Jewish community and the material that defines their lives and should be preserved 
and made accessible for future generations. Thanks. I had to get that in. <laughs> well, congratulations on all, all your all, on winning all your awards. Um, Vivian just asked, where is the archive now? Can you just answer that quickly, Carol? It's in Maryland. In a vault in Maryland, nobody has access to it right now. Okay. Right. And it, thank you very much for years. that. Do you um, want to know, know, like, excuse me, do you want to know about the um, MOUs briefly? Uh, I will come back to you on that, Carol, Excellent. if that's okay. No, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Yeah. You. So um, I, I'd now like to bring in uh, Bruce Montgomery, who's international advisor to Iraqi Kurdistan on preserving archival heritage. And he's also a former professor at the University of Boulder. Colorado. He is the author of a book called The Seizure of Saddam Hussein's Archives of Atrocity. So clearly Middle Eastern Jews are not the only people whose heritage has been stolen uh, or taken away. Can you give us some other examples um, of this sort of thing? And also what does international law have to say on this question? Over to you, Bruce. <laughs> Thank you. I'm uh, delighted to be part of this uh, uh, distinguished panel. Um, I've been um, working with the Kurds and, other, and others with respect to um, their ability to reclaim the um, what are, what are known as the on-fall secret police files, which document the genocide against the Kurds in the mid to late 1980s. And those documents were seized in their 1991 uh, uprising after the first Gulf War. And then they were turned over to the US um, after the imposition of the no-fly zone to protect the uh, Kurds from Saddam Hussein's uh, 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 vengeance campaign uh, in the wake of uh, his defeat. And uh, they were transported to the United States. They're examined for a possible case of genocide by Human Rights Watch. The, uh, the effort, the international effort to bring Saddam in the 1990s to trial for genocide and crimes against humanity failed. And uh, I acquired the 18 tons of the secret police files in, uh, at Boulder. And then we, re we returned them to Baghdad for the on-fall trials of Saddam in 2000 in 2006. So that, that's one example. The, the problem with a uh, place, a country like Iraq, as you know, it's very unstable, it's very divided. Um, all the captured documents from the 2003 war and the 1991, after in the 1991 uprising, have been repatriated to Iraq, but they're in the hands of the security services. And which means they will never be made available for public study and research by the Iraqi people or anybody else. And that has implications for the Iraqi Jewish archive. What will happen if the Iraqi Jewish archive is returned to Baghdad? It, it will be either placed in the, in the hands of the security services or some other place and will never be made available to either Iraqi Jews or even Iraqi citizens or anybody else. So to send the archive back to Iraq would be to send, to send them into oblivion. It will never be made available. And international human rights law, um, it really does not, it, there are cultural property protections in the laws of war and the, uh, there are a number of uh, UN resolutions and protocols that speak of uh, uh, self-determination and self-expression of, 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 of the people of different peoples. The uh, countries, very nation states are, are obligated to protect the cultural property of minority populations within, within their own countries. But we see that's not the case in a place like Iraq or even Egypt. And uh, they, they indicate that the self-expression, self-creation, 
of cultural property is owned by the people who create the, the culture and the cultural patrimony. So these archives belong to the Iraqi Jews as much as the artifacts and documents of Native Americans in the United States belong to the tribal communities. And that's how international law uh, treats cultural properties, pro property with respect to um, uh, the various minority peoples in, in various nation states. Right. So has has um, international? Uh, yeah, has I have the impression international law has not been keeping pace with this thinking that minorities, um, you know, are the rightful owners of property, even when they no longer live in the country concerned. Is that? Uh, uh, yes. Not? Yes. I think I think that's correct. I think that's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think so over the past ten to twenty years have been so rapid and so chaotic. The international law has not kept pace with uh, cultural property uh, protections and cultural heritage of minority populations that are being persecuted and extinguished uh, within the countries of origin. I think that's absolutely right. So I think at the same time, we have precedents out of World War II where there was the whole dilemma, the whole complication about what to do with the cultural heritage of extinct Jewish communities in countries like Hungary and uh, Romania and, 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 the, and, and former Soviet Union and, and so forth. And the, uh, the allies turned that problem, that challenge over to inter international Jewish NGOs to find new homes for that cultural property. And I think that provides an example, a precedent for how a uh, cultural property like the Iraqi Jewish archive should be treated. I think this, this, uh, this issue should be turned over to international Jewish NGOs to, to address and to find a home, a proper home for the Iraqi Jewish archive. But I think at the same time, there's a dip, there's a there's a complication of the diplomatic relationship, obviously, between the United States and the uh, Iraqis. And so I think they've been operating, the United States has been operating on a matter of a diplomatic convenience, that they don't want to upset the, uh, the Iraqis, and uh, therefore the intention is to return the archive into the hands, back into the hands of the, uh, of the Iraqi state. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, that's a challenge we face. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. I just wanted to ask Carol um, about um, about this question of um, memoranda of understanding that are now being signed between the U.S. and various uh, Arab governments. Can you explain what's happening? Because I think it follows on quite nicely from what Bruce has said that that the Americans do not want to upset um, the Iraqis or indeed any other Arab uh, government. And um, they're going further than that, aren't they? They're signing these documents that more or less legitimize um, the fact that the property now belongs to Arab governments. Carol? Yes, yeah, so the progression has been from section 17 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. They clearly said, um, that, um, and the U.S. and Iraq are signatories to it, by the way, clearly said everybody has a right to their own property alone, um, as well as association with others, which would be community property, and no one shall be arbitrarily derived of his property. Okay, so then we come to the Cultural Property Implementation Act that was passed in 1983. And it governs archaeological property or products of tribal or non-industrial society and says those should be returned to the countries that you came from. However, the, the material we're looking on is not archaeological. And it's not tribal or from a non-industrial society. But this is what is quoted as the basis for returning the property to Iraq, 
okay? And there have been memorandums of understanding signed with Algeria, Egypt, Libya, Syria, Yemen, as well as Morocco, Tunisia, and Turkey um, that all talk about returning uh, cultural and religious property of various groups that, as the Jews, have been ethnically cleansed or are being ethnically cleansed, like some of the uh, Coptic Christians, Armenians, um, Assyrian Christians. Um, there's also Yazidis, Mandeans, and the list goes on. So if you've been ethnically cleansed, and I wrote a law review about this, a law review article about this in 2003 for Fordham International Law Review. Um, if you've been ethnically cleansed, and there is an international definition of genocide, ethnic cleansing, and human rights violations, and that's the progression, um, then there is a way to say, these are people that are ethnically cleansed. And if they're ethnically cleansed, they should be entitled to that cultural property because if it's sent back, they can't see it. Not everything has been digitized, facing the same problem the Egyptians are. And it was, it was taken um, from the Iraqi Jews without their consent, their physical property, which is guaranteed under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And again, I come back to the simple definition. It's not archeological, it's, non, it's not tribal, and it's not from a non-urban society. So it seems to me pretty clear. It's just everybody's avoiding what's pretty clear to be able to take it. And, and the definitions that are used in the uh, memorandums of um, understanding um, make it very clear they're talking about Torahs, they talk about the languages, they talk about uh, objects that are used ritually, they talk about books, they talk about um, treatises that are written by religious leaders. All of these things are in great detail and they talk about Judeo-Arabic, Arabic, and of course, Hebrew. Thank you. So, so what you're saying is that these MOUs, Memoranda of Understanding, will entitle the various governments to, um, to ask for artifacts, objects, books, et cetera, that are in America or Europe or anywhere else to come back to their countries, well, is, that, is that correct? Kind of. It's correct in terms of what resides in the US. So it's a memorandum between the US and let's say Yemen or the mm -hmm. US and Syria or whatever. Okay, mm -hmm. so the memorandum is between two parties, but other countries are doing the same thing. So you have the British have already, according to Edwin Shooker, in the last year returned some Jewish property from the British Museum, okay? Mm -hmm. And so this is being handled. We're looking at the microcosm of the US, but these kinds of memorandums of understanding are being done with many, many countries doing it country to country. That way, avoiding a little bit of international law. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a very sad situation. And, and when you get into the nitty gritty of it, it even gets more complicated. But this is not like the Bible Lands Museum case where they're dealing with stolen property that was stolen from the museum in Iraq or um, material that's archaeological. It goes back, you know, was archaeologically found. This is not like that. Mm -hmm. This, to me, is really the pride of the Iraqi Jewish community, and we have no idea if there's the equivalent of the Aleppo Codex sitting right there because they've never brought in the proper rabbinical and academic scholars who know the languages, who could look at it and identify it. The one time we did, we found three volumes of the Ben Ishkai, but we weren't allowed free access to everything. But that just shows you how much is there that they didn't know about. This is right. 17 years that we haven't been able to get it all digitized or even to get a list of what's there, a full right. list. Okay, so um, a very sad situation. I'd like to turn to our legal experts, and we have a few here on the call. Can I start with Nitsana Darshan Leitner, if you're there? 
Are you yeah, there? I'm here. Anna? Yeah. yeah. Eileen, how are you doing? Hi, thank you very much for joining us. I know it's it's difficult for you because I think you're in a hospital at the moment. Not, yeah. not, <laughs> not because you're ill. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I'd like I'd like you to comment on what you've heard so far and, and perhaps what what uh, what is your position as uh, the founder and director of the civil rights group Shurat Hadin? Right. So thank you very much for having me on this uh, call, uh, discussing this uh, crucial, important issue. Um, I line up with uh, what we heard before uh, from Carol and uh, Bruce. Um, and, and I agree that uh, ultimately disputes over heritage uh, from any country, not, on, not Iraq, uh, Iran or a Middle Eastern country necessarily, but any country um, will ultimately be resolved by memorandum, by diplomatic efforts, by agreements between states, between communities, and not necessarily by legal actions. The reason for this is that a country... Um, yeah. Uh, the reason, yes, the reason is that a state enjoys sovereign immunity. Every sovereign state cannot be sued in court unless the lawsuit is, bring, is brought inside the country itself. You can sue Germany in Germany. You can sue England in England. You can sue Iraq in Iraq. You cannot sue Iraq in the United States or Germany in the United States. Um, when you try to do that, they all enjoy sovereign immunity unless they, um, you can prove some exceptions for the Sovereign Immunity Act. And um, in this way, can have legal proceeding going on against the state. So for instance, in our organization, in Surat Adin and any, in, in some other um, law firms that represent terror victims, you can bring lawsuits against sovereign states that violate international law, violate terrorism um, and committed terrorism or supported terrorism. Um, but this is due to an exception specifically written in the Foreign Sovereign Immunity Act, saying that a country that sponsored terrorism, a country that is designated as a state sponsored terrorism, is no longer enjoying sovereign immunity and American citizens who got killed or injured can sue this country in the United States. You can bring lawsuits against Iran, against Syria, in the United States. When it comes to other exceptions, again, you have to prove them in court. So there is an exception that um, if you take something, if you have a right for issue, a property right for uh, against a country, and you can prove that it was taken away in a violation of the international law, um, and this property was owned by an agency or instrumentality of a foreign state, and this state engaged in a commercial activity in the United States, you actually can bring a legal action against the state. And I'm familiar with one case of the Chabad Lubavitch group that uh, brought a lawsuit against Russia, against the uh, library, National Library of Russia and the National Archive, Archive of Russia. Yes. For... I, think, I think we have Nathan Lewin on the call, actually. And Nathan's he... actually unmuted. Yes. Nathan wants okay, to so <laughs> he can talk, talk I to let... us about that case. Definitely. Yep. So I will let uh, I will let Nathan. Uh, good to see you, Nathan. Um, to um, to uh, elaborate about this case um, and, um, and and to set up as an example how legally you may pursue the uh, the artifacts, the heritage, the property in court, but how low your chances ultimately to collect and to enforce the judgment. Because even if you, um, even if you um, convince the court that you have a legal right 
and the court grants you a judgment as it did in this case, meaning orders Russia to turn over and to give you back your, uh, your the property, the heritage, still there are a lot of difficulties enforcing it. Russia is a sovereign state. Iraq is a sovereign state. In order to enforce the judgment against the sovereign state, you need the collaboration of your own state, of the state in which you brought the legal action aid. And as Nathan, I'm sure, um, will uh, elaborate, um, the United States State Department did not agree to cooperate with the plaintiffs, with the Chabad Lubavitch group, and to help them to enforce a judgment. So they're holding a very good judgment which is unenforceable. Mm -hmm. So the conclusion, uh, unfortunately, and it comes not only to heritage or not only to, um, uh, you know, tour scrolls or community-wise a property, it comes to every uh, property that belongs to individuals, to uh, groups, to organizations held by um, Middle Eastern countries, the, uh, the way to pursue them will be eventually by diplomatic efforts and unfortunately not by legal actions. Thank you very much, Nitsana. So I'd like to hand over to you, Nathan. Perhaps you can elaborate a little bit about this case. Well, I'm delighted to have had that, this introduction from Nitsana, for whom I have great regard. <clears throat> But I have to say, I disagree with the conclusions that she's reached. There are a couple of differences between the case that we brought and successfully won in the Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia for Chabad Lubavitch and Iraq, the Iraqi uh, uh, archive. The one principal distinction of course, is that the Iraqi archives are in the United States. So far as the Chabad archives and library, they are in Moscow. We have a judgment that a district court in the District of Columbia has entered, which requires Russia to pay Chabad $50,000 a day for not producing those archives. I think the amount now comes to millions upon millions of dollars. I don't even know exactly what it is. But of course, that, that makes it difficult to implement the order of the federal court that the books be brought back. We did bring the, the lawsuit. We were successful, partially successful in the district court, and then entirely successful in the Court of Appeals, at which point Russia picked up its marbles and left. They simply said, we're not going ahead with this case any longer. Although they originally litigated it and paid a lot of money to a very leading law firm that represented them. Then they lost in the Court of Appeals and they said, we're not going any further. And the chief judge of the district court has entered this order, which now entitles Chabad to recover literally millions of dollars from Russia if we can find those funds in a way that would be consistent with the Foreign Sovereign Immunity Act. So if one could bring a case in the United States against Iraq to collect these objects, then I think it would be possible to get a court to order that they remain in the United States. Then the question is, what exception is there in the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act that would apply to these records that Iraq took? Now, as I understand it, and I think it was corroborated by the introductory statement, Iraqi Jews were expatriated. Their citizenship was taken away. And then these documents and the records were taken by Iraq, which now claims to own that property. Mm -hmm. Now, international law says, as Nitsana correctly pointed out, 
that although you can take the property of your own citizens, you may not, under international law, take the property of foreign citizens or of people who are not your citizens. The Iraqi Jews, at the time this property was taken, were no longer citizens of Iraq. Therefore, it was a violation of international law for Iraq to keep these documents. And I think there is a very substantial case that can be made in a court in the United States, in the District Court for the District of Columbia, that these documents belong to the Iraqi Jews because they were taken when the Iraqi Jews were no longer citizens. Now that's related to a side issue in a case that was litigated before the Supreme Court of the United States this past year. The question was whether uh, very valuable silver and other artifacts which Hermann Goring took from uh, German Jews in Frankfurt in 1935 was, could be litigated in the United States. And the Supreme Court indicated, <clears throat> although they rejected basically the claim that was made by the heirs of that property, they said, well, if the heirs could show <clears throat> that they were no longer citizens of Germany when the property was taken, they might have a valid claim under international law. And I submit to you, really, and I wonder whether Nitzana would agree with this, that the Iraqi owners of these records could claim in a court in the United States that the taking of this by Iraq after the Jews were deprived of their citizenship was a violation of international law and could therefore be recovered in the United States District Court. And I wonder whether Nitsana would agree with me that this could be done in a United States District Court. Nitsana? Um, actually, while, while we're waiting, um, I wonder what advice you would have, uh, Nat, for Ifedida and uh, the campaign to get access to the Egyptian records, given that a fair proportion of, of the Egyptian Jews were not even uh, nationals of the country, were foreign nationals. I mean, is there a case for uh, well, going to law? There is is whether that those records were really individual property. <clears throat> I think the Iraqi ex, uh, uh, property was really owned by individuals in Iraq, whether it was Torahs or documents or papers, whatever they were, they were privately owned property. Egypt is a little more difficult because those seem to be sort of quasi governmental records. I don't know, I haven't focused on that, but the argument I think that Egypt might make is these are government records that we've kept here. And as I understand it, the request is just a reasonable request. Not, we don't wanna take the records and take them out of Egypt. We want you to keep them. We just wanna make copies of them. Now making copies is quite a different matter. That does not mean removing them from Egypt. It just means somebody paying to make, to digitize it, to make copies of it. And that's much easier than in, in a legal sense. I mean, I don't know what legalities one goes to. And maybe, maybe in a some sense it's harder because you can claim your own property back. Maybe you can't simply claim the right to copy government property, a government can say, look, uh, we are just not going to let you copy this. And that's what the Egyptians are saying. So they're two very different cases, I think. Iraq is really a claim to the ownership of the property. Egypt is a request to copy what uh, 
uh, is in the government records, essentially. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. Can I now ask uh, Aurora Kassir um, to give her point of view? She is a litigation partner at Troutman Pepper Hamilton Sanders. She's the chair of its pro bono committee, a child of Holocaust survivors and a refugee from a communist country and a, a devoted, passionately devoted to pro bono causes. We, we like that, Aurora. And uh, you have actually uh, been um, involved in the Iraqi Jewish archive um, issue. Can you explain to us a little bit what, um, what, uh, what you've done? Thank you, Lynn. Lynn, you've actually helped me do it and I'll explain. So thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. <clears throat> Shana Tova. Uh, I'm very impressed by all the speakers so far. And here's a document that I'd like to show you. I don't think you can zoom in on it any further, but what this is, is actually a copy of a complaint along with a memorandum of law in an action entitled Carol Bassery, Lynn Julius and Cynthia Shamash Kaplan individually and on behalf of all persons otherwise similarly situated against the United States National Archives and Records Administration, the Republic of Iraq, and the Iraqi Ministry of Culture. This action, this complaint and memo of law uh, relied on the shoulders of giants before us on the Chabad case, on other cases dealing with sovereign immu immunity, and relied on the drive and the persistency and resolve of this group of people here. Uh, I was contacted by Carol probably in 2013, 2014, when I was actually at a different firm. Uh, of course, that a couple of mergers ago, that's all I mean. And to see what I could do about keeping these archives in the US. And, and like Nitsana and like Nathan and like others, I was not sanguine about the chances of keeping the archives here. And my immediate reaction was, let's try the diplomatic front. We were in the middle of the Obama administration. It was not a very receptive administration to this cause. Uh, and we did contact people like Lynn and people like other people who gave us um, a lot of very moving affidavits as to their family connections to the contents of an exhibit that was circulating first in Baltimore, then it came to New York. And people had come to visit and said, oh my God, this is my mother's birth certificate, or this is my father's sidur, or whatever. And so we got these affidavits and prepared for litigation. But in the interim, what a lot of the clients, I would say, I'll call us call it us, but it was really you, the clients were doing. We're talking to people at the State Department. They were talking to people in government. They were talking to rabbis, politicians, anybody who would talk to us. And I was on several of those calls would be tapped on to try to keep the archives here because we were not particularly sanguine about what the courts would do. We only had one shot at this to keep them here. The threats to send them back were constant. <laughs> Sorry so, about that. Yeah. Uh, my background, because you talked about my, you know, my, my background as an immigrant, but I've also litigated some cases against in from the Nazi era. So so one of my early cases was to litigate against the global giants like Siemens and Volkswagens for payment to the victims of slave labor in Auschwitz and all of the ancillary camps. And there I was able, together with a bunch of other attorneys, wasn't me alone, we got some settlement. It was peanuts, but it was a sign that people were not slaves, that they were being paid for their work and they did not. It was some sort of, not financial compensation, but psychic compensation. I mean, it was a couple of thousand dollars each, as I recall, but it was a victory nevertheless. At the moment, I'm fighting for retrieval of Nazi art that was stolen from Austrian families. 
this is one of that pattern of taking that remains uncompensated. And in this case, we want to stop the taking, the taken property from being returned. So essentially what we ended up doing um, is finalizing these papers over the Labor Day weekend in 2018. Carol called me on a Wednesday or Thursday. I, quite honestly, I was sitting at the pool vegging out. <laughs> and she said to me, it's time. They're going to give back the archives. And I said, Carol, you couldn't have given it at the time. Anyway, um, I did galvanize the troops. We put a couple of associates in Washington, D.C. And we, Nat, we did bring the case in district court in Washington. But, and we cobbled together all the papers. They were about 90% done, but it still takes a lot of work to get the final 10% done. And we continued to talk to people during this entire time. And it involves all the principles. It talks about all the principles of sovereign immunity and stolen property and individual rights that Nat and Nitsana spoke about. I think we're covered, but I would update it if I had to file this again. Why do I say I had to file if I had to file this again? Because we had the papers ready to file. I had the messenger at the courthouse steps. We had to give notice to the National Archives. And we took the papers by hand to the National Archives. And I called the people at the NARA to tell them it's coming, be ready to go to court. Because what I was seeking was an injunction to prevent NARA from giving back these records, these archives. And about 10 minutes to four o'clock and the courts closed at four for filing purposes, it was a Friday. Um, this guy called me back and I was trying to find his name and I couldn't because I didn't have the time to wade through my computer. You, you have it, Carol? Anyway, I get a call from this guy who says, you don't have to sue us to keep the archives here. I'm not going to send them back unless I give you plenty of notice to go to court. Time is on your side. Uh, so I called Carol, I, she called other people. I said, are you willing to put this in writing? And he said, yes. And he sent me an email to that effect, telling me that he would give me notice if there came a time when they would move these archives or were threatening to move them. So we agreed to not to file the case. Now. I could just hold on and keep an eye on it. Now, I can tell you that every once in a while, I get a call from Carol or someone saying, uh-oh, you know, they're threatening to take them. And then I call this person or I call someone at the United States Commission for American Heritage, U.S. Heritage, uh, and ask them to look into it at the State Department. And unless so far I've gotten assurances that they're not going anywhere imminently. Um, I, I, what I, I have, thought it was, by the way, Gary Stern. Does that yes, mean that? Yes, Nara, yes, exactly. So would I have preferred that we ent could enter into an agreement with the Iraqis at the time, as well as Nara, to say these are on permanent loan to the United States? Yes, but what actually happened at that time was that there was a change in government and there was no one to talk to. No one wanted to take in the on the Iraqi side. Nobody wanted to take the responsibility of saying in black and white, don't worry about it, they're gonna stay with you. Uh, instead, they just kind of went along with a NARA request and said, we'll give you plenty of notice. You can assure the Iraqi Jews that we'll give you notice and don't rock the boat now because if, we have to, if you go to court, we are going to have to oppose your application. And one of the, the exciting things and the sort of in, unpredictable things about going to court is that you don't know who your judge will be and it could go either way. And once it goes either way and a judge says, I can't enjoin the return of the archives, 
the next step is for the Iraqis to say, hand them over. So the decision was made, and I believe it was, I don't know that everybody who had given me affidavits was involved, but a fairly large percentage was. The decision was made to hold off. It's now 2021, exactly three years, frankly, since that incident, since the case was a hair breath, hair's breath away from being filed. And the archives are here. Now, I'm very disappointed to hear that they haven't digitized anything in the interim, but maybe that's a bit bonus because the claim can always be made hey guys, you never digitized it. You are not safeguarding the heritage of the group that really owns it. So, to my mind, the strategy for keeping the archives is a carrot and a stick. And diplomacy, connections, uh, talk, 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 don't stop talking, and have a lawsuit, have a complaint ready to go at any time and show that you mean business, you're going to file it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that, Aurora. And just to clarify what my involvement was, um, I had to submit an affidavit to um, uh, Aurora's uh, case because I ha happened to have an ancestor who uh, printed books, uh, religious books in Iraq. And this was my emotional connection to the archive. And that's uh, that's my story. <laughs> Your affidavit um, said that you had 42 items in that exhibit. Unbelievable. Right. <laughs> I can't say I've read any of these books, but uh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> anyway, I just want to, before we um, bring this to a close, I just want to give the panelists, any panelists who want to uh, have a final word to, to um, contribute to this discussion, to let them uh, have it. I think the panelists are unmuted. Yes, I've, Eve. I've, I've, I've Eve. Asked both I don't think Sana has unmuted. Though. Okay, no problem. Okay. Yeah. I, Eve, I, Eve yeah. go ahead. Yes, thank you. I think there's a, obviously a fundamental difference between Iraq and Egypt uh, in the way that, first of all, Egypt has always protected its heritage all heritage, whether it's uh, Christian, Jewish, or, or, or Muslim. Um, we've never ever had uh, fundamental problems with the Egyptian government about protection of synagogues, for instance. They even went to the extent of rebuilding a synagogue. Uh, they even went to the extent of spending a lot of their money on, on re re restoring the Alexandria synagogue. And through thick and thin, through the revolution, through people in the streets uh, shouting that they would murder anyone, um, synagogues have been unharmed. Um, if anything, it is basically the people who, who were protecting the community, who were running the community, who separated themselves from some of the synagogue. Also, we have a fundamental difference in that we have some very good-willed people on the spot um, eh, both in Cairo and in Alexandria, who are doing a fantastic job of preserving and uh, are contributing to the, the, the restoration of what does not belong to the government, what the government cannot protect. For instance, cemeteries. Um, in Cairo, they've done a fantastic job of restoring the, the Basatin Cemetery um, with the uh, 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 intervention of Atra Kadisha. And uh, it's been an ongoing uh, job, which has been obviously should have happened many, many years ago, but finally the, the Drop of Milk Association, which is running, which is made of volunteers, Muslim volunteers and Christian volunteers who are, are preserving that heritage for us. Obviously this heritage is, is, I mean, we're very happy that it should be preserved in that way. And they also have libraries and books and so on. And they're trying to, to get their act together to put all this in, in one place and so on, and to open that to the public, uh, and maybe security considerations to be taken into account. But the thing is a completely different situation. Um, we have goodwill people on the spot. We have a government protecting its, its heritage. And obviously that is for what is good for Egypt. Now, I am interested for what is good for the Jews. And I am very respectful of Egyptian law all the more so 
that Egypt has been respectful of our heritage there. And therefore, I don't think we should, obviously we've, we've consulted with lawyers, pro bono lawyers, and, uh, both in America and, 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 and in, in England and in France. And we've been told that sure, you know, we have a case, we could probably win the case, but to enforce the case, we, we, we could be, you know, I mean, our great grandchildren would be still trying to do that. And it, it's, it's a waste of time. And finally, I think it's, the Egyptians are in, extremely intelligent people, extremely uh, cultured people, that what amazes me is that they cannot understand that a simple copy is going to do no harm. And this simple copy is extraordinary because it's the lives of a whole, the whole community of Egypt from the 18th, 1820s on, um, which is there. I mean, we have con with their family connections where they came from. And remember, Egypt was a, was a crossroad. In other words, people came to Egypt in, in the beginning of the 19th century. There was a very small community. It's not at all the same as the Iraqi community. And it was composed of people of very diverse origin, we had a big Ashkenazi community, the big, uh, you know, Karaite community and a, a Sephardi community. It, 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 the wealth that you can uh, understand, that you can um, put forward uh, of um, explaining Egypt hospitality at the time is, is just extraordinary. And that they cannot understand that really amazes me. So I, I just want to, to just come back to one of the things that you said about rewriting history. I think rewriting history, once people have left, is inevitable. Um, I think if you have something on the spot, and people on the spot who are um, who are witnesses, who stand, you know, the, I remember Mil Milton Milton's poem. You know, they also serve who also they they also serve who only stand and wait. Um, and the, the people on the spot who are presenting what was the case before, um, you will always end up with the truth being, being, being uh, coming, coming out. So as far as we're concerned, we have a much better inventory than, than what, what the Iraqis have. But obviously I'm extremely jealous of the Iraqis because if I had all that, all these archives outside of Iraq, I mean, I would be forcing not the government not, I would not be fighting the government to return or not to return them to Iraq. I would be fighting the US government to digitize them first, first and foremost. This is what is essential. And this is basically what we're asking from the Egyptian government. Property today doesn't mean anything. I mean, it's, especially when you're talking about books and, and, and documents and so on, the actual holding of the property doesn't mean anything. So, so what you want is the content of these, of these things. So I, I think that I, I would have loved to have been in Iraq because I would have had a different fight and possibly have been winning that fight. And fortunately, or unfortunately, I'm from Egypt and the fight is completely different, but respect to the Egyptian government. Thank you very uh, much. Yes. Uh, may I address that last point, please? Yes, About sure. digitizing the document. There is a... a theory that would say digitizing and there's a temptation to digitize the documents so no matter what happens you have them and I understand that but we're talking to a large extent about some private property here to which people have emotional ties and emotional attachment Different. and you're also and in terms of litigation strategy if everything is digitized then there's the perfect answer for, to returning the originals. You have a copy. What do you need the originals for? Yeah. So it's it's always a sort of a judgment call. It's a judgment you can call. You can give the copies to Iraq and then keep the originals in the, yes. in the United States. Or uh, I just want to make yeah. one one quick point. Yeah, go After ahead. Several years ago, when you were dealing in 2013, the problem, one of the major problems, was was the Prime Minister uh, Maliki. He was an authoritarian. He was carrying out purges, cleansing the Sunnis from, from power, leading to uh, the rise of ISIS and the outbreak of new sectarian uh, civil war. Now you have a pro-American uh, prime minister in place, Mustafa al-Kadimi, 
who was a co-founder of the Iraq Memory Foundation with uh, the longtime dissident uh, of uh, Makia, Kanan Makia. So this may be a very good time to push the diplomatic effort to come to some kind of an agreement. I don't think you're, you're gonna find a better, more receptive uh, Iraqi prime minister uh, than you do with Kadimi. So if you can push the diplomatic effort, you may, you may get someplace. It's a good idea, thank you. That's a good insight. Very much, thank you. And um, I, I was actually speaking for um, um, Kanam, uh, Kanam Ikea, and he's, a, he's somebody that I know uh, for the, um, to create a museum of what happened under Saddam Hussein. I worked very actively and I, I went to Capitol Hill for that and everything. So I think he might be receptive and he knew about the Iraqi Jewish archives and he cared about the history of Iraq. So I'm, I'm more than happy to take up that suggestion. I hadn't realized that right now. Um, but going beyond that, I just wanna go back to the fact that uh, the Farhud has been um, recognized as part of the Holocaust, at least in giving um, Iraqi Jews who now live in Israel uh, a pension based on being survivors of the Holocaust. Um, so I, I think there's a lot going on there. And the fact that over a thousand people died in Iraq during the Farhud is incredibly important um, because again, the history should not be rewritten um, by other people than the Iraqi Jews. And lastly, we do have part of the archive digitized, but it was just done for purposes of creating the exhibit. It was not done for academic purposes and it did not have the appropriate scholars, rabbinical scholars looking at it. So I don't wanna mislead anybody that we have, you know, don't have a digitized library. We have something. But we don't know if the Aleppo Codex equivalent, I mean, we did the Babylonian Talmud. I can't imagine that things weren't left behind that are very, very precious and may not even be listed for whatever reasons, because nobody has been able to go in and look at the whole archive. And we take for granted what happened. But when I even talked to the State Department and the person involved there is Steve Epstein. When I talked to him, he said, we didn't digitize everything and we didn't have academic scholars. It was simply done to do the, um, uh, put together this exhibit. So we look for things that were appropriate for an exhibit. So things that you can show, things that are easily movable. We didn't get everything. And it's acknowledged. We don't have a full inventory and it is not digitized, even what we do have. Thank you very and much. I, yeah. Thank you, Lynn, because I think we really got some insights into what um, is possible at this time. And um, I want to thank, um, first and foremost, Aurora for all the pro bono work she has given to this. Amazing. And also, I want to thank um, Nitsana Darshan Leitner because um, she has been an amazing person and has actually uh, talked with me about the case. And now Lewin as well has talked to me about the case as well as his, um, um, as well as his daughter. Um, so I appreciate all this. I think collective minds do make a difference. Well, thank you very much, Carol. And thank you for uh, all the help you have given us in putting this together. Um, and um, I would like to hand over to Shimon Samuels of the uh, Simon Wiesenthal Center uh, to give a few closing uh, remarks. I hope. But can I also can... thank Bruce Montgomery because Bruce has been amazing. Yes. Thank yes. you. Great. Yes. Yes. I, I second all that. Shimon, can uh, can you speak? Can we hear yes. you? I, I, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes we can. Can. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I had to battle the, the um, high-tech uh, problem of uh, not having Wi-Fi at the beginning and the opening of, uh, of this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, and, um, but I, I got most of it, I think. And I, it's a very important one. And I feel uh, very flattered to uh, have been uh, invited. Um, 
I would like to just give an, one suggestion, and that is um, something that we are focusing on, and uh, we, I, we would like uh, on a later occasion to get your, your points of view. We are considering another way to uh, reaching such material as you have just discussed. Um, some 20 years ago, I met with a young uh, Russian uh, academic, uh, his name was Ilya Altman, and he was very eager to open up the records of the former Soviet Union through education on the Holocaust. Uh, three years later, we launched an essay competition on the disappeared Jews of our town. We received in that year 21 submissions from across the former USSR, uh, and the five laureates were invited to come to uh, Paris, where my wife, who was in UNESCO, arranged a meeting in UNESCO, whereby uh, they would read extracts, uh, provide with documents, uh, and um, in the presence of their ambassadors from around the region. Uh, the last, last event, uh, unfortunately, uh, didn't take place because of the, uh, of the pandemic, but the 17th year brought in some 2,500 of uh, these um, essays and from widely uh, across the, uh, the former Soviet Union. Now, the Abraham Accords may be perhaps an incitement for the many, many universities which have departments um, on uh, Hebrew, uh, Judaism, even Israeli studies. And especially uh, those uh, universities that have uh, branches with American or British universities uh, that may be interested, but I, I know that in uh, Morocco there is now an interest, uh, Jordan, Egypt, perhaps uh, um, we can hear for, for later on from uh, Eve, who is my uh, old schoolmate, um, on whether this might be interesting because uh, there's some 18 universities in Egypt that uh, seem to have some interest in uh, Hebrew. Perhaps it was uh, the Muhabarat that wanted to have uh, Hebrew at that time. Uh, but. Um, we would like to hold this event. Um, even in Saudi Arabia, there is now a department of, uh, of Israeli studies, which is rather remarkable. Uh, we would like to suggest that uh, submissions be based on archives. And uh, the winners would have a modest prize, possibly a trip to, uh, I don't think to Paris, uh, but to Auschwitz, um, or even, even perhaps to Israel. Um, and this would be a form of soft diplomacy. But we would like very much some input from uh, Harif and from uh, some of you as to um, other perhaps interested uh, sources. So thank you again. and. Uh, uh, wishing you all to be inscribed in the uh, uh, in in the book uh, of life, Gemal uh, Tov, and um, well over the fast. Thank you. So thank you very much indeed, Shimon. Thank you to all my all our distinguished speakers and to everyone who took time out of their busy lives to, to be here tonight. I'm very grateful to you all. Uh, I'm sure we will carry on this conversation. There is so much to talk about. I mean, the essay competition is, is another subject we could discuss. Uh, and uh, I know some people want to ask questions, but I think we've been here an hour and a half and it, it isn't fair to uh, well, keep everybody to going. But, but what we'll do is bring the formal uh, proceedings to a close. We'll stop the recording and if anyone wants to ask questions, uh, they can do so. And meanwhile, it just uh, remains for me and Lawrence to wish you Shana Tova well over the fast and a very good year ahead. And not just Thank from you me, very and me much. but from Michelle, Ralph and Kim as well. 
Yeah, Michelle, Ralph, Sandra. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. yeah, that's that's Harif. <laughs> Thank you very much and good night. Okay, I have, I've stopped the recording and I will let all participants unmute themselves if people want to say something. Give me one minute. Right, everyone can now unmute themselves. But can we be disciplined? I think Emil was first, then David Bassoon second, and E third. Emil? Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. I just wanted to add something to what uh, Bruce Montgomery mentioned about Kadami being able to sort this problem out. Kadami cannot, has got no power whatsoever. It's all in the hand of the militias in there. Unfortunate, it's a very unfortunate position. There isn't anybody who has got power in Iraq. Iraq doesn't run like a state. It runs, you know, totally, totally by chance. Okay, okay David. David Bassoon. You need to unmute yourself. Everyone can unmute themselves now. Well, yeah. first, thank you very much for the panel for this very informative uh, discussion. Um, now, actually, from what Carol uh, said and uh, Adrian and other, uh, we understand why we cannot find hundreds of school files because I have been going through the files carefully and we already have hundreds. And on that aspect, we can provide you with affidavit of hundreds of personal files. For example, I have my two sister files. I have the file of uh, me teaching in the school. On the communal side, I saw my parents' uh, wedding register. So, uh, but now we understand that actually there is plenty which is not digitized and not available to us, which is very, very important on that basis.